we should be. Got it. Okay, perfect. Okay. And then I'll send you the link afterwards. Oh, that would be fantastic. It, yeah. it costs a lot of money to, to get the Zoom. And I'm trying to devote everything to, so I'm building a platform. Yeah. And I'm trying to devote all of my money that goes to, to building that. <laughs> Yeah, as you know, right? It's you, you pick and choose your battles. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no. It's, uh, it, it it is so apropos that we're talking today because um, I actually caught your uh, your um, TikTok channel because you were giving advice about going to graduate school. Uh, yeah. And uh, your advice was spot on. And I actually was just giving some advice to a former graduate student um, about two hours ago who's um, trying to make some career decisions. You know, so oh, my God. I'm going to have to talk to you about this this afternoon. So I would I would love that. I think that would be really amazing. So I, I can I introduce you? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so sure. Everybody knows. I actually have a really big following on YouTube and all sorts on LinkedIn. And yeah. I've been sure building this platform yeah um and i have to i've been sort of plunged into doing this i'm naturally a very introverted person so it's yeah. all weird <laughs> um so i'm i'm here with uh chris reddy and uh -huh. he is a senior senior research scientist at the hey. woods hole institute um which is the leading institute in oceanography in Perhaps the world, maybe at least within um, within the Northeast, anyway, mm -hmm. or one of them. Um, and he reached out to me, so I we wanted to just chat because we're going through very similar experiences. I'm assuming, um, and you know, maybe we can chat about what we can do in terms of um, giving advice to. To graduate students or just dealing with the life of, of an academic, which a lot of people don't understand. It's it seems like such a foreign entity to a lot of people. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. It's a great gig. Um <laughs> I think we pay for our freedom. I keep telling I tell mm -hmm. my former students that we pay for our freedom. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and you've coached a, a ton of graduate students. I was looking at your C V and it's impressive what you've been able to accomplish yeah. um, and all the people that you've bumped into. Yeah. Throughout your, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about maybe for everybody that's listening, maybe talk about your journey in terms of how, how did you end up going into graduate school or how did you end up even just going to university and then turning, going into oceanography, oh. which of all things is. Yeah. You know, you know, I was a dopey kid in high school. I did very well in school. I never really did anything. It was just one of those kids doing my homework and homeroom and all that stuff. And, um, you know, didn't know what I was doing with my life and uh, wrestled in college, got recruited to wrestle uh, and, and to go. In I was wrestling in high school, got recruited to go to college, uh, got accepted with kind of a partial scholarship. And a week before I graduated from high school, they dropped the wrestling program. And so I wasn't going to go to that school anymore because I only wanted to wrestle. Next thing you know, the local uh, state university, state college that had a pretty good Division three team reached out to me. And I literally applied at my kitchen table with the head coach. Uh, I read an <laughs> application at the table and I got accepted. And I was only going to be there for a semester. And next thing you know, I graduated uh, five years later because I did a medical redshirt. So one year when I was wrestling, I hurt my knee. And so I stayed an extra year to, to, to wrestle and I, I got my uh, bachelor's degree in chemistry. I was a terrible chemistry major. I, you know, it was just goofing around. I didn't know what I wanted with my life and all these things. And then finally, one of my uh, undergrad advisors took me into his office and said, what are you doing with your life? And it was like on a Friday and I was like, oh, there's a big party tonight. You know, it was like, He's like, no, 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 no. Like, what are you going to do in your life? And I was like, I don't know. And he goes, I can tell you right now, you're wasting it. And you'll be lucky if you'd be flipping burgers for the rest of your life at this pace. And um, I was about halfway through college. And, 
you know, he lit a fire into me and, you know, I started doing research in his lab and I started doing okay. And then uh, the department chair happened to walk into the lab one day. Well, in the summer, it was the summer before I went my senior year. And he said, where are you applying to graduate school? And I said, I'm, I'm not going to graduate school. You know, I don't have any money. You know, I don't know what I'm doing. And he goes, oh, no, 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 you know, you, you know, you would get a stipend, you know, you, you know, he told me all about graduate school, about, you know, that, you know, in graduate school, you get supported and it sounded like a great thing. And so I was all in and I was somehow or another convinced that I wanted to be a, what they call a laser jock, which is a, a, a chemist or a physicist who likes to study reactions with lasers. So you flash a, a laser um, light onto a chemical and then it breaks apart in a picosecond and then you study what happened and you spend about a month setting up the the light the lights to make this reaction and I got accepted all these graduate schools and all of the um, open houses the labs I went to were three floors below um, ground because they had to be so dark and I was like there was absolutely no way I'm going to spend the next five years of my life in the basement so I said no to all those graduate schools, my senior in high school. Nobody was happy with me. Girlfriend, parents, advisors. And, um, you know, I took a job as a chemist at a small little factory. Um, worst boss ever. We got fired every Friday um, afternoon by the boss, a small company. He fired us every Friday. And on the Monday, uh, his assistant called us back in and said, if you're willing to apologize, Bill will rehire you. And uh, is, is that true? Oh That's yes, not true. Oh no, 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 no. Ultra oh, scientific wow. in Kingston, Rhode wow. Island. No, we would get fired on a Friday sometimes, and then wow. his uh, secretary, a woman named Avery, would call us and say, um, "If um, if you're willing to work harder, uh, Bill will consider rehiring you." And then you went back in on Monday afternoon, and you had to plea your your poor performance to him. And then he would hire you, but then you weren't paid for that basically eight hours that you didn't work. And, yeah. <laughs> and I was on salary. I wasn't making a lot of money, but I was on salary. There is no yeah. greater motivator to go to graduate school than, you know, being fired on a Friday <laughs> and then doing your uh, Monday morning confessionalism uh, and, uh, you know, a couple other things along the way. And I was working in another lab and I kept asking my boss all these questions in the lab analyzed drinking water. And my boss goes, you shouldn't be here. You know, you need to go to graduate school. And um, he goes, if you're interested in environmental chemistry, you should go see this guy, Jim Quinn. He's at the University of Rhode Island, literally two minutes away. Um, and he was in the uh, School of Oceanography. Um, and I went and saw him, and next thing you know, I was enrolled, and next thing you know, I finished my PhD in four years later. And then after that, I went to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution as what they call a postdoc. I did a postdoc for two years, and then I've been on, uh, you know, tenure track um, for now 23 years. Okay. Okay. And I am I not a very good swimmer. I don't own a boat. Don't really like to scuba dive. I do like to fish, but I am an oceanographer. Yeah, of all the things, right? So yeah, do you yeah. spend most of your time, do you go out onto a boat or uh, do you spend most of your time in the I, lab? You know, I study oil spills and other types of pollution. A lot of pollution ends up being on coastlines. So I end up yeah. uh, walking around coastlines and picking up samples and looking around. Um, but I do go on what we would call the big research vessels and what we would call blue water. So, you know, miles offshore. Um, yeah. Some folks love doing that. There's a certain romance to it. Uh, I don't really love, love it, but I'll do it. You know, I like doing it. Some good research opportunities. But, you know, I go where the research questions are. And if they're collecting samples in California, then I'm going to collect samples in California. Um, yeah. Do you spend most of your time writing or are you yeah. doing mostly data collection? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. So much writing, right? I, you know, I like being a chemist. I like yeah. being in the lab. I like mixing chemicals. That is like, really, and that's what I would identify if somebody asked me what I do for a living. Um, yeah. But, you know, I was in the lab yesterday for about two hours. And, uh, but for the most part, as you know, I, I read and, write emails and 
and and I spend probably maybe eight hours or ten hours just talking to yeah. people, a lot of students and postdocs about career advice. It's been a lot really? of fun. really, really. Yeah. So you're you're at a stage where it's kind of changed for you, where where yeah. there's a you've got a team, I guess, at this point, right? Yeah, I run a small yeah. lab group. I've never had a. I, I've never understood how anybody could run a big one of these research factories. You know, I've always had yeah. five, six people. Um, but a lot lately is, you know, I have a few postdocs and I have a, some other students and things like that. But um, but I spend a lot of time talking to each one of them about their careers. Um, two of them are applying <laughs> for faculty jobs. And, um, you know, one of them was interviewing this week. I bet you we worked for probably six or seven hours. Um, yeah. You know, I'm not going to win a Nobel Prize, right? I'm I'm not going to get into the yeah. National Academy of Sciences. My last promotion was 14 years ago. And, okay. um, and you know, I'm tenured. I'm going to get paid every two weeks until whenever yeah. I retire. And so yeah. in my mind, uh, my best marker of success is, you know, the success of the people who worked with me. And so... It's so how important to sort of change how you view the world and sort of have a good sense of self. That's, that's what I'm always trying to push back on because it's super hard. I mean, inside, <laughs> like for me, I struggle with that a lot and, and I'm trying to be as truthful. Uh, so everybody sees that, right. And they sort of understand that there, there is the outside world measures you by your, your CV and which I think is like, very normal in any other career if you were being measured in sales or or wall street or whatever they could be measuring that and you have to find put the 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 pieces of the puzzle that allow you to to keep going and and those i'm a strong believer that to build a robust team you don't focus on performance metrics no. Right. I think those are those are the, the the thing that you you tell to to others that that are probably watching you, but um, it's so critically important to to talk to people um, and to build just trust, right? And it, and and, it, and it's super interesting from my perspective because our as somebody that studies organizations and business and decision making, like that's one of the biggest things that we talk about and we, we study and yet it often doesn't equate that way within the scientific community where we focus on performance metrics. Um, yeah, and so part of it's because, you know, we have Google Scholar, we have all these currencies yeah. that are measurable, but you know, in my mind, my proudest achievement may be that all my former grad students and postdocs like me. Uh, yeah. And that's, you know, and that's the truth. I mean, you know, we're all, I'm friends with all of them. You know, I collaborate with some of them. You know, there are other, you know, former student advisor relationships that are strained, uh, you know, in one way or the other. And um, so to me, I, I really value um, you know, the personal connection and the fact that, um, you know, that you might have been a student in my lab 10 years ago, but we're still, you know, we're still working or friends um, together. A uh, former student of mine, she's a dean at a, a very prestigious liberal arts school. And she said, I got an offer to go give a talk in a foreign country. Should I do it? And I looked at it. I was like, oh, yeah, Definitely. You know, and you know, just <laughs> touch that they're asking me for my advice, and and while you oh can't God. put that on your CV, uh, it doesn't get you big awards, but you know, there's the personal satisfaction of uh, being so lucky. You've been doing this for a lot of years now. What is it that keeps you going? Well. You know, I mean, being a scientist in my mind is this great opportunity to work on this ever expanding, you know, jigsaw puzzle of science, right? You know, that science is this this really wonderful opportunity to study something and try to add a piece to a puzzle and, you know, fill it out and, and you know, making it prettier or more well-resolved. And I just think that that's as good as it gets. I mean, 
to me, uh, I get to do science in a way that is as fulfilling to people who, you know, do the New York Times crossword puzzle. You know, yeah. that sense of asking a question and chasing it down and and seeing whether or not you're, you know, what you think might happen, happen or not happen, which is often more fun. Um, yeah. You know, you know, I don't want to say addiction because that's not a medical term, but it's <laughs> hard to beat, you know, the chase. Yeah, absolutely. So a, a, a couple of questions that I had in my mind yeah. was, how did your conception of science change over um, these many years? Like from when you were thinking at it, you can imagine somebody that's in high school and you're thinking of a scientist, a researcher, to where you are now. What would you, how is that different? What does that look like? Well, you know, I think that a lot of folks, for whatever reason, when you're when you're taught in high school and even in college, that there's a sense of science is memorizing and and film strips and you know uh, you know and writing lab reports and kind of this somewhat menial tasks and and not particularly fun. And mm. the more I do science, the more uh, you know. I don't worry about the. I don't memorize everything to me is looking at what, you know, these pieces of, of a puzzle and trying to visualize how you can put them together. And so being a scientist is not about memorizing. It's not, I mean, you have to have a knowledge base, but it's not what you're, what the perception is of memorizing and, and, you know, this kind of dreary routine of doing a lab experiment. It's a much more, um, journey and exploration for answering things that you find curious yeah um for for me i i had this conceptualization that science was like this fixed thing and we kind of knew what the world was and that there is this like truth yeah right but once you start doing it you realize like it's it's unfolding in so many ways and you pick one little tiny thing and even that one little tiny thing it is so wrong, like how we conceived it before, and we can we can go down that direction and start unfolding it. And then when you do it, you realize, oh my gosh, I understand why it was wrong because it's hard to study it in so many different other ways. Um, and I think that's yeah. glorious. I, I just think yeah. that's like the greatest thing that we can continue to refine and consider. And you know, um, science isn't perfect, but it has a much better track record than other things that we read and hear about in the news. And these yeah. opportunities to continue to just kind of tell our story a little bit better. And and it's okay sometimes to be wrong, you know, if it's an honest, you know, the way it is. And that, I mean, to me, that's like reading a great, turn, uh, you know, page thriller that something twisted and changed and, you know, it's honest and that's just life, you know, and that's okay. Yeah, that's that. That's actually what I wanted to, to talk to you about. That was the second question was, how do you deal with, I mean, often we do have things that go wrong, but not only do the results just don't work, yeah. but then as well, we screw up, right? Like we're a giant, often a giant mess. And you're like, what the hell did I do? Like six months ago when I saw this thing and what was I thinking there? How do you deal with the negative experiences that we go through? How do you pro what do you tell your graduate students? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think the first thing I try to, to do is to try to set up research questions that whatever the outcome we find, it moves the field forward, right? And that, you, you know, that I think that some people set up, set up their hypotheses of what they want to do so that if they don't get the result that they are thinking or they want, then they failed. And it's much better to set up a research question saying, well, if it's this, we're going to go that way. And if it's that, we'll go the other way. And, you know, having uh, having a, an approach to understanding that that as long as you plan and, and execute the research in a proper way, that whatever the outcome you get is is beneficial. And that, to me, is really one of the key points. Because being a scientist is hard right now, you know, uh, Three quarters of our proposals get rejected and 
papers are getting dinged left and right and you know you're slogging along and you know you never know where you are and you know i have crippling imposter syndrome i mean there are days i can <laughs> right and you know yeah, so yeah. but yeah. you recognize this opportunity and the freedom of being able to explore and that's yeah. what i press upon like you know look we are exploring and you know these are great opportunities and the work that i work on i work on oil spills and divine and you know designing next generation materials and plastics and so it's super yeah, rewarding. And, 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 uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, that's that's an interesting thing. I always view myself as is on the edge of failure. I don't know if I'm an academic or I'm having a nervous breakdown. <laughs> Most of the I, like, I don't Yeah. <laughs> I, I recall telling somebody I was like, Oh, this this you know I person I never met before, but um somebody had said, Well, why don't you talk to Chris about this? And I remember telling my wife, I was like the funny thing is I'm, I'm suffering from the same problem. This person's coming to me for, yeah. <laughs> and I'm supposed to give them advice. And my wife, who is a mental health therapist, God bless her, Bryce. Um, yeah. She was like, no, then you're the best suited to help them. <laughs> <laughs> Does she see things in you or she's like, oh my gosh, you know, what are you guys doing? Yeah. You know, it's funny. My wife is a mental health therapist for children and, but we never talk shop at home. Like I, yeah. um, you know, uh, I mean, I'll tell her if like, you know, one of my postdocs wives is pregnant or something like that, but I never really talk too much about, you know, um, science, science at home. Yeah. Uh, that's like super hard. That was a hard thing for me. So my wife's actually a veterinarian. So she's a scientist, but she couldn't, yeah. she couldn't care less. Um, like, you know, she's got a science background, but she couldn't care less. I love her. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's another thing. It's not like, yeah. you know, this sort of pondering, nerding. It, it's kind of like uh, researchers and scientists are kind of like uh, a group of people that would be prone to go to Comic Cons a lot, right? <laughs> like, they're, they're really, uh, you're, you just kind of are, you get, you get very nerdy. Um, and, you know, how do you deal with that? That was always a hard thing for me to deal with. Uh, I would have these experiences of, you know, maybe going through some discovery um, or, you know, not discovery. It's like super frustrating. And then I have nobody to talk to as much about that. And maybe it's a little different in big science, like the stuff that you do. Um, I It's funny. I, um, I recall... Um, that um, before I met my wife, I have a great relationship with my wife. I love her to death. I just never really talk shop at home per se, but yeah. I certainly would tell her, if, you know, but I remember being single. I own my own house and I would be coming home and it was incredibly depressing because there were days in which I would have to get a grant um, funded and there was nobody that I could tell I just got this big grant and there was nobody who could hold my hand when something got rejected. And um, my wife is just absolutely wonderful. But having, you know, somebody who I could talk to or about, you know, um, you know, she doesn't care what the grant is about, but she's thrilled that I had good news. And I, I do think that yeah. this family or teamwork, you know, that I always tell, you know, scientists do not let science define you, right? Like never get science too closely connected with your, your identity because science is so hard that you do not want to have bad times with science and let that transfer into your everyday life. That is so different from the idealistic norms that we have, right? Like I would say that you're very countercultural with that because you would be considered, and I'm the same way too. I, I yeah. completely sympathize with what you're saying. I'm not saying that you're wrong, but I completely sympathize. Yeah. Um, and that's where I struggle often is like, oh, I've got this, this conception of me yeah. and this conception of me as a researcher um, is I should take this very seriously and I should spend all my time in the lab. Um, or for me, it would be at, at the desk, right? Thinking and analyzing data. And if yeah. I don't do that, then I must be problematic. Because, you know, this, 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 you know, I don't know if it's true or not. I should really look it up. But I think, you know, Einstein at one point, one point said there's no 
there's no um, room for family and science, right? It rings, rings, I don't know if it was accident or not, but it rings in my head all the time. And here I am, a big buffoon. I got to run off at, you know, five o'clock, get yeah. my kid, yeah. you know, do the, the mad dash, <laughs> yeah. as you know, and then homework now with my older kids. So I'm always feeling like, I'm just not living up to it. I'm, I'm not. I'm not doing what I should be doing. Uh, and how do you reconcile that? Oh gosh. That's, that's, well, that's, I mean, the first thing is thing. that I just simply do not prescribe to this kind of macho um, attitude that oh, my students have to be working every day, or they need to be in the lab ten hours a day, or whatever. First of all, it's not safe. It's not sustainable. It's not a way in which we continue to recruit and retain the most talented people. You know, and we need to start asking ourselves if we can't achieve what is necessary with, you know, maybe nine hours a day. You know, as I said, I'm happy to work nine hours a day, you know, here and there, and I'm happy to sneak in a little here and there. But, you know, you have to recognize that. If science was a sport, it's baseball. It is a long game. You know, it is, you know, you've got to hang in there. And so I'm a firm believer that, you know, we should keep, you know, try to work hard and, uh, but do not let science be your identity. And uh, any of this, I call it macho crap. You know, this, oh, yeah, we're working on that. <laughs> I, I, I know it is, yeah. No, but I mean, I've heard this. Uh, oh, I was in the lab till two o'clock cranking away. And, you know, as a chemist, I go, well, first of all, that's not safe. Right. I mean, you don't want to be working with chemicals at two o'clock in the morning. But I think what people, what people fail to forget is, yeah, that might have been a heroic thing. And maybe you had to. Maybe you were doing an experiment where you had to collect the sample every half an hour. And that's fine. But, uh, you know, you pay the piper when you get yourself out of a, out of a, out of a routine. And so yeah. you, know, you work till two o'clock one night, you know, you're not going to have your A game the next day and the next day. And so just like we strive for sustainability for a better climate right now and a better society and earth, I think sustainable activities as scientists uh, is utterly critical. I'm such a big fan of you now. <laughs> awesome. I mean, I think it's, it's such a because we need to change these norms essentially, um, and, and but these these norms are deeply rooted in in a lot of um, not only scientific efforts but many parts of of um, you know society in terms of work. Yeah, and if if we're going to start being more open and allowing other people to join and participate, we have to be as flexible as we possibly can, and know that. You know, individually, we're not going to be as productive, particularly, I think it, it works okay in um, my family is very egal egalitarian. So I do, I mean, not as much as my wife. She's, you know, the statistics will bear that she does a lot of the decision making. But I, I still, you know, I'm, I'm running around doing, picking up kids and uh -huh. things like that. So I, I know I'm never going to be it's emasculating, right? Like I'm never going to be the quote unquote man or macho person that you're describing that term macho. Um, yeah. I just literally, I can't, I can't stay up that late. Um, it's just not going to, it's not going to happen. And then you're right the next day. Um, you know, what does that, what, what happens the next day? Yeah. Right? Um, uh, and it then sounds like you were talking to my, you sound like me talking to my therapist last week. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I literally yeah. had this conversation with great. you know my um my my dad passed away three weeks ago. A wonderful guy, 87, married to my mom I'm for so 66 sorry. years. Oh yeah, thanks. Uh but wonderful. You know, I was one of seven kids, you know, the American dream 10 times over. And I I uh my current grieving process is to look very closely about you know, what is the most valuable way I'm going to spend my, you know, 16 or 17 hours of the day now? Like I, I've been really looking in closely and, and saying, you know, I am going to squeeze life, you know, and um, 
and I, I think I'm becoming more uh, choosy about where I'm going to invest my time. And so I, I, I hope you're not viewing as like squeezing life in terms of I'm going to be as productive as possible. No, no. I, but, I mean, you know, it's more like, um, you know, like sometimes I, I clean the kitchen uh, every night, right? And um, a lot of times I, I'll mop the floor, right? And I'm going, like a couple of days ago, I was like, does it really matter if I mop the floor tonight? Or would I be better off, like, you know, doing a puzzle with my six year old daughter? Right? Like, does it matter? Like, and my wife yeah. could care less. Right. I mean, and, you know, so I'm asking these types of, you know, relatively minor questions, but like, yeah. why I want to spend 15 or 10 minutes of my life uh, at seven o'clock at night, you know, like, and, you know, just trying yeah. to thinking about what is, you know, does it matter if my floor is dirty? You know, like, it doesn't matter. You know, does it matter? Does so many things really, really matter? Or does it matter more that, you know, my, daughter and I are watching, you know, some YouTube video together. Just the fact that she's sitting on my lap. Right. I mean, Isn't that, yeah. but Isn't I, that awesome? oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I do have to kind of mention, I mean, you know, Dave, I live a very charmed life, you know, I mean, um, I've never really, you know, struggled per se, you know, I've had countless amounts of fairy godmother and fairy godfathers look after me. You know, my, my, I was, my last promotion was in 2010 and the way that my position is structured, um, you know, there's an expectation for me to do solid work, but, you know, I get paid every two weeks, no matter what. And so yeah. my biggest challenge, which is somewhat probably very unusual in some cases, is that my biggest problem is myself. Yeah. What is, what is defining success? For me is what I struggle with um, because I have yeah. really nice bosses. You know, like, the director of my institution, they're all so good to me, you know? So, <laughs> uh, so I worry sometimes when I'm somewhat cavalier about my lifestyle, but I've been afforded tremendous amounts of luxury and I have a very luxurious professional position right now. Yeah, I think about that a lot as well. I think, you know, in general, I always compare myself to, you know, especially recently, the last few years where I've been very thoughtful about this stuff because I've been open and speaking about it. But I've been thinking about, like, what would have my grandparents went through? Well, my, you know, they were they were in dire poverty um, yeah. for many, many years, like real bad poverty. Right. Um and you know my 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 grandma was uh, she she was an orphan because you know her her mom died. Like I think about how luxurious we have life today, and we're sitting in a privileged position where we can think about this, right? Like a hundred years, you wouldn't even consider thinking about this. It was more life or death. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, totally agree. Oh, yeah. You know, like I always reflect on that. Like, what, what a, what a powerful. So my, 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 on my other side is my, my, my dad came from Poland. They left in 1935 because um, they were in trouble with the police. You know. <laughs> um. Duh. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So you know, I think about like how privileged if this is the case that we live in this very privileged position. And I know that if you're to watch the news, the world was going to, it seems like the world's going to fall apart. And things, you know, like we're te teetering at the edge of yeah. world collapse right now. But I think about like, if we can just realize just how privileged this is and we can turn a lot of the things that we're doing right now into amazing opportunities. I think about, you know, it, particularly in your area, there's the the young gentleman. Um, so I teach innovation, yeah. And there's this young gentleman out of the Netherlands that started doing the great cleanup in mm -hmm. high school. Yeah. In high school, now he's like cleaning up the ocean. I was like, if yeah. that one person, that one lone nut, can do this, 
Like, what else can we actually do if we apply our minds to it and we become part of that? I absolutely um, agree. I think that there, uh, again, I think there are great opportunities out there. And um, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, uh, the luxuries that we have. And, you know, I am not uh, the world is going to fall uh, type of person. I am. I recognize that we live in a time of peril, but I am much more hopeful that the standing stock of knowledge and and the and the somewhat silent good the good people who want society to succeed uh, far outnumber the folks who are rattling drums. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, I think so too. And I, and I uh, we just live in a in a moment where we could do those things where you pick a big large. That's part of what the whole reciprocity project is for me. It was like, um, you know, it, it started as when I stepped into, so I, I went into my, at the time it was my department chair's office. I was like, can I get some money to get some editing done on, on some of this work? Um, she said, no, we don't have the money. We're at a state institution. And I was like, well, shit, I teach innovation and entrepreneurship. Why can't I build a platform? So then I started going, I, you know, I built this thing. I got platform, I get the developers in the Ukraine that fell through. Now I've got developers in India. And then um, as I started, I put it on the internet and I got crickets. Nobody paid, nobody cared. Um, and then I started, you know, a friend of mine said, why don't you talk on YouTube and start talking about this thing on YouTube? I was like, oh, whatever, YouTube. And so I was super nervous. But as I, you know, I made a habit of, doing this every day and as i've done this i've realized that there's these massive pockets where there's there's a lot of people that are in the same boat that we're going through sort of grappling with this i guess it's like you know the existential what what am i doing here um you know I, it just i need to be reassured <laughs> so this has been really interesting from documenting this as kind of like a scientific point or a scientific view of like a scientist uh, diary of me figuring out what it is that is missing in these pockets mm -hmm. um, and how we do things. So science is very much, it's cut and dry and can't be, you know, there's, there's not a lot of personality, but we know that there's actually a lot of personality within the scientific community. Yeah. Um, and I, think I wish we knew more about that because one of the yeah, big exactly. problems. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think that these, and this might sound crazy, but I think stereotypes in science, which are so untrue, actually hurt science more than people think. And I like you know, TV shows like Big Bang and whatever, you know, they're, I mean, yeah, there's some quirky people I know, but there's no Sheldon Coopers and all these people. You know, I mean, like, yeah, <laughs> we might be passionate about what we do, but I think this perception of last pick in gym class uh, really yeah. hurts science. And uh, I don't know many last pick in gym classes in my world. Well, that was me. <laughs> but, but, you know, you know, but I mean, to, uh, that perception far away yeah. is the fact that, you know, uh, you know, that we have personalities and that we're just, you know, that um, there's a rich different types of personalities in science, just like really? in any other profession and just we should like celebrate. Any, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think so too. And I think we need to start, um, you know, tackling some of these harder issues that, 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 you know, things like gender and inequality and things like that, that we're well aware of that are existing yeah. Um. And and start, you know, making these social changes and what that actually means, right? Like opening up with some of these things, tackling some of these things, yeah. and you know, de destigmatizing a lot of the stuff. Like you, the fact that you openly talk about, like you went to your therapist three weeks ago. Like that oh, is incredible. That's such a that's an amazing thing. To, to I tell I uh, so many people. So I I have no problem saying this. I was in a uh, car accident in um, April of 2019. I was driving to give a lecture in Connecticut. I live in Massachusetts. I fell asleep at the wheel and about five in the morning and I got a concussion 
It was my third concussion over about a year for other reasons. But point of the matter is, is that my head wasn't working well. I was going to the neurologist and um, eventually this neurologist said, you know, um, you ever been diagnosed for ADHD? And I was like, no. And um, she goes, I think you have ADHD. And I was like, oh, I, you know, I, I, I might be a slacker, but I, I just thought that people who had ADHD, you know, couldn't sit still and didn't do well in school <laughs> and all these things. And she said, do you want to do an experiment? And I was like, oh, yeah. And she's an MD, PhD. She goes, why don't you take this um, this drug called Vyvanse, which is kind of a next gen, kind of a little bit more clever um, stimulant. And um, the next day I took 20 milligrams of Vyvanse. It was August 7th, 19. 2019 beyond the birth of my children and my getting married was the greatest day of my life. Um, that this drug oh. provided clarity, you know, it, it's not an accelerant, my a stimulant, it, it provided a way in which my brain settled. And, um, my life has changed hundredfold since, um, really? yeah. And, um, so I work really hard with, uh, I work with a team who are helping me, who works um, solely with kind of what they would call, they call high achieving adults with ADHD. And um, my work helps me. I meet with a coach, kind of an executive coach on Wednesdays at 1130. I meet with a therapist uh, 945 on Thursdays. They, the three of us talk, we talk with my neurologist. And, uh, you know, that's just part wow. of so I was, maintenance. I was uh, diagnosed with it a couple of years ago. Um, I have not taken the medication. I just, I took the, the you could, there was a antidepressant that you could take was off label. Um, yeah. And so that's what they prescribed because it's, you know, non, non addicting. Yeah. And I had this really bad reaction to yeah. it like hallucinating and so i've been afraid to do anything um since but i completely understand the um the brain fog. like when when i was so my wife like we were going through something um my wife told me it was like you know you should look into this thing this adhd thing i think you might have it and then i started watching it was like oh my like videos online oh, oh. this is so me Oh, <laughs> I, I, I remember like after being diagnosed and there was more, more testing and things like that. And I remember saying to this guy who I'd known for 20 years, I was like, you'll never believe this, but, um, you know, I have all the, you know, I have ADHD and he goes, yeah, who would have guessed that? <laughs> you know, like, like he, he goes, I just always he assumed knew. you knew. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. And no, I see all these descriptions and I look at my whole life. And, um, you know, I was like a classic case of it and I just never knew when, you know, fell through the cracks, are, but, yeah. but it's most likely that this last car accident ex exasperated, exasperated the, made them worse. I can't speak, speak okay. today. So in many respects, yeah. they expressed a little bit harder after I banged my head and I'm okay, okay. with that. You know, my wife and I talk about me as a person after taking this drug huh and i'm curious i'm just curious what what did uh, you I, I, the the sense of relief i mean i put it this way before i started taking that medicine i could fall asleep at the drop of a hat anywhere and i was always tired enough i could fall asleep anywhere and um after i was taken taking that medicine I didn't need to. I used to crave to want to go to the movies. I wanted to crave the places where it was quiet and where I could shut my brain off because it was so racing so much that I was always ready to fall asleep. I would I would fall asleep on the floor, anywhere. And um, after taking this medicine and getting help, I don't take any naps in the daytime. You know, and this isn't because it's a stimulant. It's that. My brace, brain is relaxed and yeah. it's an unbelievable feeling. I'll go even one step further. Huh. 15 years, 
I would have, I had this thing called um, angi- um, idiopathic angioedema, which means that for no reason whatsoever, I'd have a swelling event. My lips would swell, my tongue, kind of like a slow moving um, amphiphylactic shock. And I would have to take um, an EpiPen or a Benadryl, occasionally have to go to the ER. And this would happen maybe eight times a year. And if I cut my hand and had to get stitches, I would have it. And if I was super stressed, I would have it. Um, went to Mass General, all these places. Um, they're like, ah, it happens to people. After I took Vyvanse, I haven't had a swelling event. And Why? Why yeah. do they think that is? Because my brain is relaxed. You know, I mean, uh... yeah. So I don't have, I've lost so many other somewhat negative aspects of my life um, because, you know, I have a, you know, a prescription drugs. I have the right therapist. I have the right coach. I have the right yeah. neurologist and my primary care physician. I mean, they all know what's going on. And I mean, I'm a super lucky person. I have great health insurance, you know, my, my work, yeah. you know, and, um, but I have no problem talking about therapy and coaches and, um, the two women that, uh, I talk to every week, uh, I think they're the greatest thing in the whole world. I mean, that's amazing that you're so, um, I think everybody needs to know these things. I mean, like why, so I still have, um, I don't know. I struggle with the whole medication thing in terms yeah. of me personally, yeah. whether I'm going to, you know, I, I go back and forth. Right. Yeah. And, um, and, but having a team or having like no having a support group no yeah. matter what the support group is if you paid for it or not yeah. um you know it's such an important part of just life um i'm just getting through things. yeah so, i mean i you know yeah you know. we need to remove the stigmatism of getting mental health therapy without any doubt because it's the same as if you were hiring a trainer at the gym or Heck uh, yeah. Yeah, or yeah. taking music lessons or anything else that you do to help you in your everyday life from having an external non-family, non-friend member. And, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, these people give me the the mental health spotting of my everyday bench pressing. I mean, whatever you want to call it. But absolutely. That's I love the way that you phrase that, um, particularly within our career, because I think in a lot of uh, maybe not in the high functioning careers which i'm privileged to be part of yeah um where you're not constantly being critiqued all the time yeah. right like it, it's always this you're always being sliced and diced yeah. all the time different angles uh and so having somebody to coach you through sometimes is is you know sometimes is a godsend um for me i do a lot of therapy while i'm walking yeah <laughs> or or shouting on a at a, at a camera yeah <laughs> you know yeah. like those things are and it's fine important. you know the, there's no yeah. this whole and i i you know the funny thing is i'm as macho and as good as ego as big as anybody else but i think that we have to remove the stigma the you know the stigma of recognizing whether it's a you know informal or formal way for us to improve our mental health whether it's walking or seeing a therapist there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And yeah. in a very point in my life, I've um, saw therapists and you know gone through many. But particularly, we had some you know just troubling things that we had to deal with in in my immediate family. With my my, I've been wa- married for um, seventeen years now for a long time. So you know you go through things. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just have to learn how to to cope together. Yeah, um, yeah. So, uh, but these I, bumps, I, and bumps and jags and and dodges make life richer. Yeah, I think so too. And and I think you know part of what I'm trying to do with with just being open online is, and it's scary for me, really scary for me. Um, is to let other people know that, hey, we're okay, no matter what we choose. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, stigmatism I find where 
if you don't do a certain route in the research game or academic game, then then you're considered not good, yeah. right? Like maybe yeah. you go into industry or whatever, yeah. and just letting people know whatever you choose is hey, it's fantastic. It's uh, your I, your business. <laughs> the arguably the most productive postdoc I ever had. Um, who had, uh, I, I, first of all, I've been lucky to have such super talented people work with me really, really, but arguably one of the most productive, um, scientists I've ever had work with me, um, left my lab, went to work with another lab as a second postdoc, killed it. And then she went and took a faculty job. And I remember her, um, talking to me about six months in and said, I can't do it. I hate it. And she said, don't be mad at me. Love it, at you. Are you happy? Well, she goes, I'll be happier. And now, you know, she works in a nonprofit, um, kind of a volunteer coordinator. And I would tell her, I was like, I bet you you'll be a great, you know, volunteer coordinator because she has tremendous science chops. And that helps yeah. you, you know, formulate questions, identify how to solve the problem, how to interpret, and then how to, you know, synthesize and distill. And, you know, so, yeah, you can get a PhD in sciences, and still provide incredible value to, to society and yourself without having a research lab. In fact, science is better off. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. better off if we yeah. had, you know. <laughs> I think so too. I think we should encourage more people to go and do those those um, different routes because, you know, then, then there's more people around that understand what this is all about, understand the conversation. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. It, I it, think... Um, I couldn't agree this, more. Uh, this this gentleman, what's his um, the guy, the astrophysicist that goes around talking about science? Oh, Neil, um, uh, Neil Tyson. Yeah, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. Which yeah. you know, if I, I remember watching a video of him saying that you know he couldn't basically couldn't hack it in grad school, or that's that's what he was told. But now he's like he's the guy, like he's he's yeah. doing the right thing. And um, he's, I mean, I've, I've never met him, uh, but I, I study him, you know, like I, I yeah. you know, uh, I, you know, when I listen to science Friday, I, I more usually listen to how the science is talking and acting than the actual, the science itself. And when I see him, uh, Neil, you know, <laughs> uh, I look and see it's somebody who's at peace and happy about what he is doing and he is excelling. I think he's outstanding. That's so cool. I think he's outstanding. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah, really, and... really so smooth and so confident. And um, huh. I mean, like it or not, he's extremely likable. And you know that I think, but that comes through when you're, when you're uh, um, confident and, you know, feel comfortable. Says the yeah. cat. <laughs> but yeah I mean, <laughs> I mean if you want to look at something that's a non-traditional route like you know this guy has yeah, a national absolutely. physics doesn't run a research lab he has a position but I mean yeah he's not cranking away in the lab writing papers and proposals but you know you could also say that his impact and significance is far outweighs five other far away. yeah far yeah. away you know and so yeah I think that's wonderful I think, yeah. golly, I wish that you were, uh, <laughs> I wish I would have met you earlier. You, I think there's so many things that are uh, very insightful. And I'm glad that you reached out. Um, yeah, I, it's so funny because, you know, I'm a woodworker. I got into watching TikTok and stuff because I liked that. I was learning so much about, you know, woodworking is all oh, such good stuff. I mean, it's amazing how much I have improved my woodworking game from TikTok. It's like astonishing, right? But, you know, the TikTok algorithm, for whatever reason, something sciencey came up, right? And I watched it, right? And of course, then it starts, you know, so then I start getting more science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then some academia thing came up and then you started popping up and I was like, well, this guy gives good advice. And, you know, it was like, you know, advice number 26 or something like that. And I was like, yeah. And you know, the one about, you know, I can't remember exactly what it was, but like, you know, don't do a PhD. Uh, you know, I can't remember exactly where you framed it. And well, it's the same thing that I always tell people, which is you go to undergraduate to make your mom and dad happy. 
You go to graduate yeah. school to make yourself happy. Yeah, and that's the, I mean, it's, it's so I struggle with that um, because, you know, I'm telling people not to go into science, but if you listen to the message, it's oh. uh, go into science for the right reasons. Reason. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it, that's right. I mean, I see students, not necessarily in, you know, my career from either universities that I, you know, my colleagues or even some of my students and hear that, um, you know, a lot of the students struggle because, um, you know, they're doing this to make somebody else happy. Uh, well, and expected to do that. And, um, and that's hard. Part of, yeah, no, part of that's part of the reason why a lot of these things that I talk about is part of the reason why I did it. Yeah. It was like, you know, I was trying to impress and somehow in my mind, I was like a lonely high school kid. Yeah. I didn't have a lot of friends and um, I finally found a group of, to hang out with like in, in midway through high school. But for the first couple of years, I was super lonely. And so it was always in my head of like, how do I perfect myself? Right. Like if I do these things, then people will like me. Yeah. Right? Like if I do all of this kind of stuff, all of a sudden everybody's going to like me and, 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 you know, my life is going to change. Um, but that never happened. And one of the white ways was like, oh, um, you know, I'll go get a PhD and then I'll be some, somebody. Right. Yeah. Uh, and never, never amounts to it. And you realize it's kind of like this never ending journey. Um, and so for a lot of, particularly in the last few years, because I've been open is just letting go of that, of just saying, and um, I probably shouldn't say this too loud, but like, fuck it. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm a yeah. decent person. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. and, and that should be good enough. It should be good enough. And I tend to think that the folks who are evaluating or asking our questions are probably above average to start off with. Right. I mean, like, yeah. you know, the fact yeah. that we are, have the capacity and willingness to self-reflect uh, points to, to, to a certain level of success already. Yeah, no, that is absolutely, I, I think about how much- That's what my therapist says all the time. Yeah, well, he's, he's, a lot of people can't, right? Like they're, whether they have, a, you know, maybe they, they have personality disorders and all these kind yeah. of things, or they just don't have that part of their brain where they, they have that inner dialogue. Yeah. Right. It's it's a weird thing. Yeah, I think I'm super lucky to be able to do that. And I think in part it I have to tell you that, you know, my wife has had such an unbelievable imprint on my mind and soul because she's a much better mm. person than me. <laughs> so uh <laughs> her sense of understanding uh has um really changed my life. That my wife does not my wife is not a pushover, but she's much more understanding and non-judgmental. And when mm. you uh, reflect on things a little bit and not be so hard, um, it is, you know, I have truly benefited from my wife since so many wrote. But certainly, I mean, she doesn't get the copay, but her therapy on me every day is uh, the best. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic that you say yeah. that about uh, oh, noise. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, no, like I, I couldn't imagine what I would um, be without, yeah, no, anyways, I, I don't want to go down there, but my, yeah. you know, the, there's, there's, I think there's reasons why you end up matching up with the people that you match up with. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I tend to think that probably I may rub off well somewhere for her. I You know, this imposter syndrome is really tricky, right? I mean, this this constant reflection, constant reflection, but um, but I think the key thing yeah. is that it's okay to constantly reflect as long as you look at what you're producing and evaluating. Like, you know, like if you just keep worrying about it, then it's not productive. But you know, asking these questions is really just, you know, an evaluation. And so how do you pivot from saying, am I doing good enough and asking and then actually looking and evaluating, right? And so that's the trick, right? It's okay to keep asking. It's just important that you're asking, listening, and evaluating thereafter. 
I love that. I th I think that that is fantastic. I think for um for me it's been uh destigmatizing a lot of things that I've I've sort of think about and what I go through and be open. Right. And view myself, I sort of I'm trying to view myself as a living, you know, research memo, I guess, mm -hmm. right? Of documenting all these kind of things. So I think they're so important. And and part of that sort of research memo um is 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 going through all those sort of self reflections and being able to talk about them. And I think that sort of opens me up to, to more exploration. And um Certainly, it's connected me with with really interesting people, um, which I would have been too afraid to do those a lot of that stuff five years ago. Just yeah. absolutely too afraid. To do yeah, that. you know, you took yourself out of your comfort zone, right? I mean, that's leadership. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, you roll the dice, and uh, it's working out well. Um, <laughs> well, is there anything that you want to talk about? Anything I want to talk want about to uh, two things. Um, I um, so I've been driving. I was driving back and forth from Providence for, to Providence, Rhode Island, from my house in Woods Hole, Woods Hole in Cape Cod. And it's about an hour and a half. And for whatever reason, Amazon said you should read this book. You know, I, you know, I'm, I read books and listen. I started listening to this book. Um, and it's called, uh, arguably it's the best book I've ever read in my whole life. I listened to it and it's called the exceptions and it is written and I, I might mispronounce her last name, Kate Zernicki or Zanaki, Z I, oh God, I can't, um, she writes a story about this woman named Nancy Hopkins, who was a biologist at MIT who, uh, struggled and was just awfully treated as a biologist at MIT um, through the 70s and the 80s. And um, Hopkins built a syndicate of other talented professors, women professors at MIT to make significant and dramatic change about their treatment. And this book documents uh, Nancy Hopkins's career. And I can't tell you how moved I have been to understand the struggle that this woman had, how she overcame it. Uh, it, it I've bought 10 copies already. I've written to the author. I have the Nancy Hopkins. I've sent three or four emails to her asking her, how did you do this? And why is that? And, you know, it's, you know, as we push forward about, trying to make things and improving DEI. And, you know, there's lots of great data out there and reports and I, I, I support all them. But if you want to appreciate um, the challenges and the struggles, but also the hope of solving problems, um, you have to read this book. Uh, mm. It is that good. It's called The Exceptions. Um, I will tell you, driving to Rhode Island, I must have screamed WTF. I cannot friggin' believe this happened. No way. And, um, you know, it's just one of these things that, uh, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I don't know why, um, why it hit me so hard. Um, but this is the kind of book that society should be reading. And it's, you know, it got reviewed in the New York Times. It came out last February, but, um, more folks in academia should be reading this book. And the interesting thing is the book is called The Exceptions because the argument was is that some of these outstanding science women scientists were the exception. And that's what they were. Yeah, absolutely. And, absolutely. you know, in reality, the way that um, the way that Nancy Hopkins over, overcame it was in reality, she was. The, uh, the MIT faculty was treating the success of any one female scientist as an outlier, you know, like, on, yeah. a, on you know, the, oh, oh, she's, she's successful. She's an outlier. And what, what Hopkins did, because she's a woman. Yeah, yeah. She's a woman, but she's successful. What she did was she went and found 15 other successful uh, female professors who were excelling at MIT and she showed that they weren't an outlier. They weren't mm. 
you know, exceptions, they were incredibly robust. And the way in which uh, she oh, succeeded boy. was teamwork, but also proving with real hearts and minds um, uh, that, that, that they weren't exceptions, that they were the norm at, at where they were. Yeah. And it's yeah, just, yeah. It, I, I don't know what else to say. Um, it just, you know, maybe I was in a different spot with my dad passing away, but it's the type of book that I look forward to reading again. But I can't read it again. I'll, yet. I'll definitely check it out. Um, and then I think that's pretty a normal response to people doing things that are on the fringes of society. And I think a lot of us do that, yeah. right? We are sort of afraid of workers in innovation. We sort of have this view um, that innovators are are you know doing something as positive. And in in reality, society often views them, society being like you know just groups of people. Um, views them as unusual yeah. or weird or problematic they shouldn't be doing those things yes. you know you're you're the you're raising you're saying these uncomfortable things that they don't like to talk about yeah um and you know it, it's it's sort of poking at at something that's challenging um that nobody wants to openly talk about and I sympathize dramatically because I think we all resonate with some, sometimes yeah. with uh, doing yeah. things that are unusual. What makes this story even, I think, more compelling was that Nancy Hopkins was not just dealing with a difficult faculty or, you know, trying to sway somebody. All these people had Nobel Prizes. I mean, she was dealing, you know, with these folks trying to make meaningful change. And, I mean, she was in the show and overcame and yeah. you know it's you know it's just one of these stories where i think that you can have a lot of reports and they're important and tabulated data about how you know how we need to improve uh dei and more opportunities and that's all needed but books like this where they hit you in your heart and your belly and your brain uh can make some super compelling arguments that just cannot come through with a bar graph. Yep. Yep. I agree. I and you know, that's an innovator, right? You got to tell a great story. And that's yeah. not disingenuous either. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, I'm so glad that you pointed that out. I'll have to take a look at it. Oh, yeah. um, and, you know, it, I've always wanted, especially with the reciprocity project, I've always wanted to create a group of people that would want to do that kind of stuff just have conversations about it how how can we and my view is how can we use available technologies how do we use especially like ai and things like that and community driven technologies how do we use those to better what we're doing and allow us to work um, not only more effectively but want to get up and have fun uh um, yeah and you know smile through it and i think that's like such a missing component um, with what, what we're all doing um, and, in, in the science community. It has to be serious, but I don't think it has to be serious. Right? No. Like the, the, the norm is that it's supposed to be serious and everything, but I don't think we need to. No. I mean, why can't we make it enjoyable? Yeah, and because the problem is is that it might actually be more successful. Right? I mean, that people <laughs> thought that, right? You know, that, you know, that you had to iron your socks and be so uptight to succeed. And, you know, yeah. you know, and I know that there's 90 million routes to succession and we should start exploring all those different opportunities. And uh, I, my take on, on meaningful change is to always start local and that's either geographic or culturally or economically, you know, you know, in science, in the chemistry lab, we always say like dissolves like, you know, that, and I think that you can have really meaningful change when folks who understand a certain cultural demographic can speak to that demographic the most effectively. And so, you know, it might just start off being geographically, you know, that um, making meaningful change in the Tallahassee area. And then, you know. You, absolutely. And, and can you, I usually ask 
the guests will send you an email, but I yeah. usually ask if you know somebody that's in, inspiring that want to that wants to um, sort of get the ideals of the whole reciprocity project. If you'd want to pass that along, yeah, um, and then we can reach, reach out to them and get them to hopefully talk. Absolutely, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I'm jealous of you. I, have, you know, two of my closest friends are uh, um, at at Florida State. They're at the Mag Lab. Yeah. Um, so, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Ryan yeah, Rogers, on, uh, and, Ryan Rogers, and Amy McKenna, two of my favorite people in the world, and they're on the. Oh, staff. That's super. Yeah. yeah, actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah. Um, one of them. So, so uh, Ryan was one of my neighbors. <laughs> oh yeah, he moved like two years ago, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Small world. He is one of my favorite people. Oh, because that's fun. That's. Fun. Do you know why, besides the fact that he's super smart, is that he's genuine? And um, I really, truly believe that being genuine and being yourself, and he's very comfortable in himself, uh, you know, really makes a difference. You know, you can feel it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how to, I don't know how to teach that, or I don't know. <laughs> I've been, I've been struggling with this. In terms of how do you, how, how do you become more of yourself? I don't know. I, mean, I think that's just years of experience, or maybe you're just born into it. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I I wish I knew the answer, but I do think it's you know it's like with the Supreme Court. You know, just said I I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it that it, yeah. sense <laughs> of wow, you know you know, this sense of comfort and genuine is safe in your skin. And, and, um, you know, it, it, it's, you know, you want to be around these folks and, um, or at least emulate them or try to learn about why do you seem so comfortable and confident? And, um, and I think oh it's God. real. Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks for too. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for too. That's cool. Well, if I see him, I'll have to mention you. <laughs> oh yeah. No, I love <laughs> Ryan and Amy McKenna. Yeah. There's lots of good folks down there um at, at the mag lab yeah yeah well um if there's anything else then no. uh you know don't be afraid to reach out at any point well i just not I mean, of course i have to promote my own book right so i wrote a book called uh oh, we can't see it we can't see you gotta uh, there's something wrong the no. background's been getting goofy oh i wrote a book called communicating science in a crisis I'm not sure what it's, um, and um, it came out about a year ago. And it, I speak principally about the challenges that scientists face when they have to communicate science to non-scientists. And yeah, that's you know, super cool. I was thinking about that recently. I actually studied failure um, and learning yeah. to failure, and thinking about how to, how are we communicating. It, it, the communication aspect is becoming increasingly more important. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, I try to talk about how, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges that scientists have is that um, in this day and age, when people ask a question, they are so hungry, they would just take a, a hot dog and a Coke. And scientists really want to say, well, if you wait five years, I'll give you this three course meal. And we have to, be able to recognize that we live in a society that wants certainty and answers in four seconds. And how does a scientist and scientists provide information that's valuable in a way in which the lay public wants answers? And it's not, there's no easy answer to it, but I do have to, we, scientists have to recognize that they are competing with Wikipedia. That somebody wants to know how many people were at the at the um, 49ers game last week and they can whip out their phone and get the answer and it's certain and it's not going to change in science, you know, is uncertain. In fact, if I'm certain about something, I'm not going to study it. Right. And so, yeah. um, you know, these are the challenges that scientists face. And I think that the lay public's biggest challenge is um, we don't need the lay public to know more about molecular biology. We need the lay public to understand the culture of science and celebrate how it works and what it does and what it means about how a body of understanding moves forward. And that, you know, science isn't a house of cards. 
we need to explain about how the process works and that it works really well, but it's not fast. And we should celebrate uh, that. And you know, it's, these are the types of arguments I'm trying to make about celebrating what science can provide to science and society in a meaningful way. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 so it's, it's more fragile than I wish it would be. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, what's the alternative? Yeah. I mean, I, I, right. I, I'm not a political scientist or anything like that, but I do make, I would do like to make a plea of folks to say, why do we have to politicize? <laughs> Can't you just go pick on something else? You know, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, oh, you mean like everything that's going yeah, on just lately? Leave yeah. It alone. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. I think it, it's an institution now, so it's become yeah. But yeah, you know, a conversation piece. Al Gore wrote "Inconvenient Truth," and um, you know, I don't necessarily subscribe to that book exactly. I, I he was on the right track, uh, it, but the point of the matter is, is that when you look, I mean, I believe in climate change and all these things. Uh, I, it was a it was a very good, very very good book. Um, but the point of the matter is, is that. I look at science nihilism and I see most of it, the pushback is when it's an inconvenient truth. Yeah. Right. And, you know, we need to accept the fact that just because you don't like the answers doesn't mean that science is wrong. And how do we get that across to people? Yeah, no, that's, that's the other thing. And, you know, ultimately, particularly with climate change, the right path and how to solve this is not necessarily clear. We, know that yeah i i i think it's the you know i think it's very real um but you know maybe it's not we don't rely on political institutions to do the things that are supposed to do and we just naturally and i think that's kind of the you know the the conversation has become a little nitpicky and everybody yeah. is like angry at each other yeah. but i think ultimately you know the side that is pushing back is is sort of suggesting, why don't we just let business take its course? But I think, you know, we need to allow that to happen and we need to encourage, we need to inspire. And yeah. and I think if we, if we have come down the, this is the scary thing route, um, we yeah. can, I don't think a lot of people are gonna go that route. I don't think they're gonna solve the problem if they know it's a, it's a hot bed, it's a hot mess. Where are you gonna no, step in? No. Uh, if carbon dioxide yeah. was a color, I think yeah. a different. I don't know. Maybe we see it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. If yeah. carbon dioxide was a color, different. I think that folks need to recognize that. Um, first of all, I think climate change is hard for a lot of folks because. Uh, don't look at your watch or anything right now, David. What is the ambient temperature right now where you are? Don't tell me. Just guess. Oh, I would say it's probably about 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Uh, um, so minus 32 is 43, half of that. Let's call it, you say, 21 degrees Celsius or something like that. Yeah, probably about um, that. Yep. Right? But it's entirely possible that if I asked five people where you're standing, you would get anywhere from, you know, 19 to 22 degrees Celsius or somewhere around there. I, and so you just yeah. asked five people what the temperature was where they were standing and it was plus or minus two degrees Celsius. And now mm -hmm. you read in the news that that the earth is going to get two degrees warmer. And I think yeah, that seems nothing. Right? Yeah. yeah, but yet, but when you heat up a whole big boiling pot of the earth, this huge mass, it does mean something. And so often we have to conceptualize to the lay public that two degrees in Celsius um, is significant. And yet, you know, yeah. so how do we make those connections and uh, how do we have hope? And yeah. why do we, you know, these are hard things. I, I, I am so happy that I study oil spills and, 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 relatively short-term challenges uh, because often the solutions are uh, come a little bit clearer than trying to tackle this large scale experiment that humans have put forth. Um, but I'm <laughs> hopeful. I am hopeful. But, uh, yeah, I, very hopeful. I, I am very optimistic. Um, yeah. I do believe in the, uh, I believe in innovation. I believe in yeah. uh, the economy can resolve a lot of really tough, Things 
Um, do I think that the solution is going to be a political solution where we arrive, but uh, every country arrives upon, you know, agreed upon thing? I, I, I'm skeptical, but I do believe that there are smart people working on this and you know, working really hard. Um, whether it's, you know, are we going to solve the problem quick enough? I don't know. But, um, you know, it's, we hope. And, and I think of that's the best we could do is encourage people to, to pursue hard problems. And even still, like I was just having this conversation in my classroom, even if you don't believe this, this fact that there's multiple people that are believing and not believing it, that's an opportunity. That is an economic opportunity that you can exploit and you can go and um, do something that that can prosper from that to move us forward. Or if you don't believe in climate change, maybe just go outside and stand beside an exhaust pipe of your car. You realize that, man, this stuff sucks. Yeah. Right? Like, it, it's dirty. Yeah. So there's an opportunity there, right? It doesn't have to be this big, bigger global problem that's that exists. It could be something that's really minor. Like you're saying, start local. And I think sometimes if you start local or the simple fact that I'm sitting here and I can hear cars going back and forth and it's super loud. It's yeah. noisy all the time. Why don't we change that? Right? Yeah. Like, like that is, that, but that's, that's what scientists are supposed to do. That's what, that's what we're supposed to do is figure out how to make this more comfortable. Yeah. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges that we have is that we need to recognize that making something, let's just say for lack of better words, more environmentally friendly, let's just call it that, doesn't mean it has to suck. So I guess yeah. let me frame it this yeah. way. Like, you know, like you hear people back in the day, oh, our cars haven't run so well since we took the lead out of gasoline. And, you know, our showers aren't good anymore because the water pressure is not as good. And and that may all be true, but we don't, we can, we can strive to have meaningful achievable change for the better of the society and make it better. Maybe you can have Absolutely. a better job and be more efficient. And that is where there are also tremendous innovative opportunities um, yeah. to be sustained. Be better. Be no, right. Why not? Right? Like we're smart. There's yeah. smart people out there. Yeah. <laughs> Go to it. Sustainable doesn't mean second place. It's no, not never. No. Heck no. Just skip that problem altogether and go find something that's even better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, well, this is this is really fun. I'm yeah. super, super glad that you reached out. Oh, my God, um, yeah. I know. I'm sure it's, like, scary. Like, for me, it's like, oh, who's this random person that's reaching? It's always like, oh, I don't know what's, what's happening. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's nice that you reached out. This is, well, this you is know, a, I tell students i just gave a workshop on communicating science to the graduate students in our program with mit on tuesday and i told them that electrons are free and that uh writing emails to people that you would like to talk to or are interested in um there's almost no the only downside is the time it took for you to write as long as you're sincere and genuine and mm -hmm. you know you can write an email to a nobel prize winner and ask a talk and you know what's the worst thing's gonna happen they're not going to write back. Yeah. Um, and um, it's okay to reach out and roll the dice. Um, and I think that networking, especially for junior folks, is utterly critical. As long as you can sound sincere and genuine uh, and the people who write back to you, um, it's somewhat self-selecting. And so yeah. uh, I yeah. wrote to you like I tell everybody else. Like, oh, wow, this guy seems cool. I, I'd love to talk to him. I'm going to write him. And you know what? If you didn't write back, it's okay. Because you're not going to wake up the next day and say, how can I screw this guy's life over because he sent me a shitty ass email? Okay? You're going to be yeah. like, so... I don't care. Yeah. yeah. No, you write an yeah. email and you say, hey, I'd love to talk to you or uh, anything. And you know, if they write back, they're right back. And if they don't, they don't. Uh, and consider yeah. the writing the email a sound exercise and trying to write a concise series of statements. <laughs> Spoken like a true scientist. Totally. So, yeah. 
I do appreciate the fact you're here, and we're hopefully we'll get this up and get people to uh, to listen to your message. Uh, and we talked about all sorts of things, yeah. and I do appreciate it. And I think a lot of people are going to appreciate your story. Oh, I'm thrilled. Uh, no, absolutely. Sight. So, all right. <laughs> well, well, uh, well. Hopefully, I'll bump into you the next time I'm I'm down in Massachusetts. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Um, you know, I'm around. I'm always happy to talk uh, to folks who are like minded. And uh, sometimes I'm down and used to be in Tallahassee all the time before the COVID. Before COVID, so I'll be back. Huh. All right. Well, it's a small town. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to right. uh, send you this recording, uh, and I'm going to send you the link to um, the two books as well. Yeah, that would be awesome. All right. Have a nice day. Okay, we'll talk to you later then. Okay. Bye. You too. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Bye.